This episode of the podcast marks the end of season one, and I really want to take a moment to thank seriously each and every one of you who has listened to past episodes of the podcast. You're listening to this one as well. We've hit over 500 plays on all episodes of the podcast, and I'm extremely humbled that there's that many plays for what I have to say about horror movies. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all. Like, I know it was a bit of a bumpy ride at the beginning with season one or season zero there. And uh, I appreciate all of you for sticking it out with me, continuing to listen to what I have to say about horror movies. I truly have a passion for the horror genre. It's not just horror movies itself. Like, I read a lot of horror novels and stories. My favorite bands over the last year has been Ice Nine Kills and American Murder Song. Like, I live horror. I love it. It makes it all the more better when I can share this passion with others who feel real similar. So thank you all for allowing me to provide you with my own brand of horror content. And I hope you learn something along the way. Like, that's my number one goal with every episode. Whether it be discovering a new film you've never heard before or learning more about what goes on behind the scenes of your favorite horror movies, I really hope that you take away something from each of these episodes. On this episode of the podcast, we're going over the Devil's Carnival franchise, which I guarantee the majority of you have not seen. (laughs) This movie is so hard to find or even like just know that it exists in general. I fluked out on on finding it. I found I found it actually through Tubi because I had watched Repo and it was like, oh, well, you may like this movie. So I checked out the Devil's Carnival and I found out that it had a lot of cast members from Repo in it, like Terrence Zunich, Bill Mosley, Paul Servino. And that Darren Lynn Bowsman was also at the helm of the film as director. So I'm like, there's no way I'm passing this up. I've never heard of this. I need to watch this. And I am so glad that I did. I I really am. If you're a fan of Repo, if you're a fan of of Darren Lynn Bowsman's work, you're going to absolutely love Devil's Carnival 1 and 2. I'm telling you right now. And it's funny because this movie actually spawned because of Repo. The film's concept was developed when Bowsman and Zunich were discussing a possible sequel to Repo. So there was going to be a sequel to Repo, but unfortunately it didn't happen and probably won't happen for a multiple plethora of reasons. But from that came the idea of The Devil's Carnival. The first look that we got at it was a trailer which featured the singer Emily Autumn and was released in late December of 2011. It was originally planned that The Devil's Carnival was going to be an ongoing project and two episodes had already been written for it. However, episode two would only be produced if they made back the cost for episode one because they were funding the project themselves. Bowsman and Zunich announced in August of 2012 that the film would be released on DVD and Blu-ray on October 23rd, 2012, and they released the movie in two editions. One was the Ringmaster Collector's Edition, which contained a Blu-ray DVD combo pack, but was limited to 6,666 copies. Wonder why. (laughs) The second was the Sinner Edition, which contained a DVD packaged with an extended soundtrack and was sold exclusively at Hot Topic. The film was then re-released as a Blu-ray DVD combo pack, which was pretty much the same as the Ringmaster edition. However, it didn't have the lyric booklet and the cover art was slightly adjusted. The first film is not very long. It's a great film overall regardless. It's about 55 minutes in length, but it definitely leaves a mark. So let's dive right in and let's talk about what's occurring at the Devil's Carnival. The film starts off by showing us John, who is grieving the loss of his son, Daniel. We also see a thief, Miss Marywood, who's fleeing from police. There's also a young woman named Tamara, and all three of these people meet their tragic ends and get greeted by the inhabitants of hell. Though I don't think John quite knows he's dead yet. He sees his son and tries to follow him, which is really the drive behind his motivations throughout the movie. And I don't think he really realizes that he's in hell, right? Because he's just looking for his son at this point. So we see hell itself is a carnival. There's disturbing creatures and creepy characters all about, including the ticket keeper, who's the right-hand man of Lucifer himself. He rallies the carnies in this big top circus tent where they're all in and starts calling out and starts calling out the names of carnies who will be performing for hell's newest inhabitants. Based on the way each of these characters look and are portrayed, you know that whatever the fuck they're going to be performing tonight is going to be a wild time. The ticket keeper selects the painted doll, who is one of the performers that is a mute woman with a cracked face. Next is the twin, who is a reptilian man with the ability to shapeshift. The hobo clown is also selected, and I don't think there needs to be much of an explanation on what that character is. Lastly is Scorpion, who is supposed to be a knife thrower. However, Scorpion's nowhere to be found from this meeting that the carnies are currently holding. The ticket keeper doesn't like this, so he sends painted doll to go locate him. 
In the meantime, we head back to the newest inhabitants of Hell, John, Miss Marywood, and Tamara. They wake up and each find an envelope with their name on it, and it contains a ticket to enter the carnival. John and Miss Marywood, they look around for the entrance and end up bumping into each other as they arrive at the ticket keeper's booth. Carnies are there to greet them and welcome them into the carnival, and the ticket keeper explains to them that there are 666 laws or rules of the carnival. He welcomes them in, and they begin to explore the horrors that await them. Then we find out what Tamara's up to. She's found wandering around behind the carnival, and she finds Scorpion locked up in a cage, same guy who was missing from the meeting earlier with the carnies. He ends up convincing her to free him, and then starts flirting with her. John, in the meantime, finds himself in the big top tent being harassed by Wick and her woe maidens. They suddenly vanish, and John sees Painted Doll in a kissing booth. She starts teasing him that she might have information on where his son Daniel may be, but she'll only exchange his location for a kiss. As Daniel leans in, she ends up biting off his ear, which then suddenly reappears afterwards in a mindfuckery game of chess between the two. Now, I'll admit that I wasn't quite sure at this point of the movie what the hell I was watching. <laughs> I really I really didn't. I'll admit that. Despite my love for Bill Mosley, Darren Lynn Bowsman, and Terrence Zunich, I was a little bit concerned that this was just going to be a complete flop. Nothing was really progressing or happening yet story-wise, but that was all about to change because I finally understood what this movie was building to. We see Daniel, John's son, meeting with Lucifer, and Lucifer's reading him Aesop fables. It's then that we discover that each of the three newest inhabitants of hell are actually going to experience different Aesop fables as their own fate, which I found to be a super interesting way to progress the story and also introduce old fables. I don't know, I just really dug that. I dug that a lot. The first fable that Lucifer reads to Daniel is The Dog and Her Reflection. This fable is going to give us the fate of Ms. Marywood, who is seen following a pamphlet map that she found, which leads her into a dark tent. The intention of this map is to lead her to a large diamond, which feeds that klepto personality that she has. This large diamond is with the twin, and it's promised to her, but only if she wins his game. However, she of course loses the game, <laughs> because you don't win in hell. And then she gets stripped naked and whipped in front of all of the carnies. All the while, Hobo the Clown is in the background singing a retelling of the fable that Lucifer's currently reading. We then move on to the second fable that Lucifer's reading to Daniel. This one is titled The Scorpion and the Frog, which is targeting Tamara, of course, as she had freed Scorpion from his locked cage. He's still flirting with her and trying to woo her, which is working to some extent. She ends up following him into a dark tent where there's a knife-throwing wheel being set up, and he starts making out with Painted Doll. She flips out completely embarrassed, tries to leave, but Scorpion starts getting angry with her, accuses her of not trusting him, and then, to prove her trust, she has to strap herself to a knife-throwing wheel, which is obviously a bad idea because he throws a switchblade right into Tamara's heart. The Painted Doll starts retelling the fable to the other carnies through song, and shows off Tamara's body to all of them. Pretty sweet scene if you ask me. So then we see Lucifer again, and he has one final fable to read to Daniel. This one is called The Devil and His Dew. With only John remaining out of the newest hell inhabitants, we now know that he's up to bat. So he's seen stumbling through a tent and passing through a replica of the same bathroom where he had committed suicide, which landed him in hell. And John continues to move through and search for Daniel when he finally finds him in Lucifer's study. However, Daniel transforms into the Fool, which is actually a dwarf carny. Lucifer begins to taunt John and reveals to him that he's actually in hell because he couldn't let go of his grief after losing his son. John then decides, well, he no longer wants to grieve. So that gets him sent up to heaven by Lucifer. It's at this point, Lucifer rallies all the carnies together and announces he has a plan to offer the condemned souls redemption and access to heaven. The ticket keeper then informs the carnies that they're going to pull heaven out of business. Come tomorrow, they're going to wage war on God and his angels. The film ends with the carnies celebrating. And that's where we end off the first Devil's Carnival, which is definitely a twistedly morbid fun time. <laughs> it really is. It's, it's short, right? Like, it's only 55 minutes. And in case I didn't mention it, I think I didn't actually, it is a horror musical. The Devil's Carnival 1 and 2, they are both horror musicals. So in case I didn't mention that, let you know that right now. And the soundtracks are absolutely incredible. Like, every cast member is super talented. And the production and the sets, everything was so just dark, yet colorful at the same time. It was really a beautiful, 
horror movie musical. I, I really enjoyed The First Devil's Carnival. Outside of Zunich playing the role of Lucifer, I also really loved the small moments where we got to see Bill Mosley. Like, he wasn't in this as much as he was in Repo, but he definitely added his own flair, which stamped on the movie. Speaking of which, let's chat a little bit about Bill Mosley. This guy has it all <laughs> when it comes to being a horror actor. I'm telling you right now. He's got the look. He's got the voice. He's got all of it. He's mostly known for his role as Otis B. Driftwood, right, in the Firefly Family Trilogy, House of a Thousand Corpses movies. But he's also played in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 as Chop Top, which many people may or may not know. Bill Mosley got his first film role at the age of 29 when he starred in Alan Rudolph's Endangered Species as a cab driver. He then played a character named Quiltface <laughs> in the 1985 film Osa, and then he went on to play Chop Top in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, which is the role that a lot of people outside of uh, the House of a Thousand Corpses movies, that's how they know Bill Mosley. He's Chop Top in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. He had minor roles after that, but then he was casted in the lead role of Ricky Caldwell in Silent Night, Deadly Night 3. He's also done work with one of my favorite bands, Ice Nine Kills, with voiceovers and appearances in their music videos. Overall, whatever movie Bill Mosley is in, he always puts a unique stamp on it. Each character that he plays is unique. He's never the same. Otis isn't the same as Luigi or the Magician. Each of his characters is unique, and that is really what you look for in a horror actor. You want somebody who can portray multiple roles, and you don't look at them and go, oh, that's just Chop Top, or oh, that's just Otis. This guy has such diversity to his talent. That's just a sign of a really great actor at the end of the day. And I just wanted to take a moment, shine a bit of a spotlight on one of my favorite horror movie actors. So thank you guys for letting me do that real quick there. Now back to The Devil's Carnival. The second film is definitely my most favorite out of the two. It's an actual full-length feature film. It's about an hour and a half-ish. And it also expands so much on the universe and the cast of characters. The soundtrack is also really cool, and it has elements of that big band sound from the 50s and 60s, which I totally dug. It was so good. The soundtrack is so good in the second one. And we caught our first glimpse into the sequel, which is called Alleluia, The Devil's Carnival, on December 25th, 2012. A teaser trailer was released and also revealed that Tech 9 was going to be in a starring role as the librarian, which he was amazing by the way. Like, he killed that role, and he really got to show how talented of an artist he is. I loved him as the librarian. He killed it. He crushed that role. The next glimpse we got of the sequel was a nine-minute trailer on January 10th, 2013, and this focused on the librarian, a few of the angels, and the dark practices that undergo in heaven. So the sequel really focuses heavily on heaven, supposed to where the first movie focused on hell, and we find out that really heaven isn't what it's made out to be. It's very cult-like, it's very um, corporate-like. They even call themselves Heavenly, I think it's like Heavenly Pictures Productions Incorporated or something, or Heavenly Productions Incorporated, something like that. The film also has some new stars coming in, including Barry Bostwick from Rocky Horror Picture Show and Ted Neely from Jesus Christ Superstar and David fucking Hasselhoff. <laughs> yes, this movie stars David Hasselhoff, but I promise you, you don't see him a lot. Production of the film uh, began on June 26, 2014, when it was announced on Bowsman's blog. And then on August 11, 2015, Alleluia! The Devil's Carnival premiered in L.A. and a North American roadshow went underway on August 26, 2015. It started in Tucson, Arizona, and then ended in L.A. on October 18, 2015. So let's waste no time, and let's talk about the full-length feature film in the Devil's Carnival series. The film opens up with a pretty grand spectacle, which really sets the tone for the movie going forward. Lots of color, lots of vibrant darkness to it, with Lucifer conducting a train full of condemned souls back up to heaven. It was a really cool uh, musical number. And one of these souls that are being brought back up to heaven is Ms. Marywood. Then we get up to heaven. We see the spectacle and lavish that it all has to offer, but everything is not as it seems, or peachy keen jelly bean, if you know what I'm saying. We meet God, and he's seen discussing the crisis of Lucifer bringing condemned souls into hell with his top dog, the agent. Ms. Marywood is then seen in an interrogation room with the agent, along with the translators and officers who are a part of Heaven's police force. That's right, Heaven has a police force. <laughs> Anyways, back in hell, the ticket keeper warns Lucifer that the carnies are not in any way prepared to go to war with Heaven. However, Lucifer completely dismisses these claims and then entertains a cloaked figure who enters the room. He dismisses the ticket keeper and then starts discussing matters with this cloaked figure. 
That's when Lucifer opens his book of Aesop fables, and he begins reading one of them titled The Filly and the Lapdog. We then enter a flashback sequence. It's mentioned throughout the movie that angels in heaven are considered applicants, and each of them are numbered based on their rank and dedication to this cult-like religious heaven. So a new batch of applicants is seen arriving into heaven, which include June and Cora, the two of them are best friends. They're welcome into heaven and offered a tour of the place, a lavish extravaganza. Though June steals a number one's armband from the designer, who's keeping number sevens working in a windowless design shop. June then convinces her friend Cora to explore more of heaven with her, though they're arrested and interrogated by the translators. This is when the agent intervenes. He immediately makes a connection and has an attraction towards June, and then he starts to get negative press against him from the watchword because of this. But despite the whole back and forth relationship between the two, God orders the agent to seduce June and expose her hearsay. So the agent starts his seduction and brings June down to a bar. God arrives as well and starts serenading one of his girlfriends in the background. The agent and June's relationship starts to blossom, and it continues to do so under the watchful eye of the watchword. Later on, June ends up stealing a key from the agent by seducing him, and they both end up in the library where there are banned books held behind a lock and chain. This doesn't stop June, however, as she enters the chains and uses the key to unlock the Book of Knowledge on Life and Death, which is absolutely forbidden to read in heaven. She doesn't care, though, that it's a banned book, because she's confident that the agent's clout will protect her. <laughs> However, when she sets off the alarm and the police force shows up to detain her, the agent does nothing to save her, and he sits down and watches her gets beaten and taken away. Once June's taken away, the librarian makes it clear to Cora and all the other applicants that one angel's misstep is everyone's misstep. So he instructs them to denounce June, and then spend the rest of their time shelving and reshelving Heaven's Library as a punishment. That's right, punishment in heaven. I really liked how they did this. They, they made it so that like heaven isn't all that it seems and that you should always be looking at things from an objective perspective. That's really a, a, a big kind of tonal piece that I got from, from Devil's Carnival. So June is then sent down to hell as a condemned soul and she arrives at the carnival. She finds the twin who challenges her to a game as she is shape-shifting herself between Korra, the agent, and June. Of course, she ends up losing the game, right? No one wins in hell. We know this. And then she wanders into the midway of the carnival where she finds Lucifer himself. She inspires him to turn the carnival into something that can be of a challenge to heaven. And it's then that he helps her transform into the painted doll. So we learn through this flashback sequence that June is actually the painted doll. Pretty sweet. So back to the present, the ticket keeper is hearing several plans from the carnies on how to attack heaven. Completely rebuffs all of them, says each and every one of them sucks. It's then revealed that the cloaked figure from the beginning of the film is actually painted doll, and she's going to play a role in Lucifer's war against heaven. Ticket Keeper shows a bit of jealousy and heads over to confront Lucifer, offering himself as a sacrifice for the cause. However, Lucifer refuses his request. Back in heaven, God dispatches the agent to hell so he can face Lucifer and try to stop this uprising that's coming from hell. He gives him a book, which contains the story of the filly and the lapdog. Then he heads out to put on a show for everyone in heaven. The agent arrives in hell, where Painted Doll has been dispatched by Lucifer to greet him. He's horrified by her disfigured appearance, but this doesn't stop her from trying to seduce him. However, she turns it around and then starts openly taunting him in front of all the other carnies. Lucifer is then seen preparing for battle and applying his war makeup, while God stands in front of an empty room and a microphone because his servants are preparing for war as well. The film ends, revealing that Mary Wood, who had been interrogated in heaven this whole time from the beginning of the film, was actually the twin. He then poses as the agent, returning from his mission. And that's where the movie ends, which is super disappointing. Honestly, the most disappointing thing about The Devil's Carnival is the fact that we have no more of it. <laughs> we, we actually don't know how the war between heaven and hell ends. There's no closure to this, and I'm so sorry, guys, to tell you that, that I'm, now, I'm now introducing you guys to something that doesn't have closure. <laughs> it, it really doesn't, which, which sucks. That's really the most disappointing thing about Devil's Carnival is the fact that it doesn't really have closure. There's truly so many unanswered questions from the first two films, and you could tell that the third was definitely meant to be the thing that tied things off, but unfortunately, it just uh, it didn't go that way. Now that wraps us up for The Devil's Carnival, and I've got a bit of a surprise for you guys. That's not the end of this episode. We're actually now going to dive into something completely different 
and we're going to be talking about Asian horror. We're going to talk about a couple of Asian horror films that I watched this year that totally stuck with me and literally scared the shit out of me. Like, these movies are terrifying. I don't know if you guys have watched, like, Taiwanese horror, Korean horror. Like, Asian horror in and itself is some terrifying stories. (laughs) They've got horror down on lock. Like, I will never turn down the opportunity to watch an Asian horror movie. I will always, always give it a chance because just the way they're able to do these movies is absolutely incredible. Western horror is the style of film that we've come to know and love over the decades. Films from slashers to aliens to survivalist movies, these subgenres all fall under that umbrella of horror. Western horror doesn't really rely on one specific issue or subgenre for films, unlike something like Asian horror, which has always been more specific in where they point their horror films. Generally, Asian horror focuses on a supernatural element, which could be demons, vengeful ghosts, curses, that kind of thing. Personally, I find some of the most terrifying movies of all time are Asian horror movies, (laughs) and it's because there's so much more haunting than western horror movies they've honed the craft of supernatural like so much so that there have been several westernized remakes of films such as the ring which was inspired by ringu the grudge which was inspired by juan the thing is though these remakes never really hit the mark like their asian horror predecessors did they're never as scary or impactful because of the reliance that western horror has on tropes like jump scares Although Asian horror does have its tropes, it doesn't really rely on them to scare the audience or keep them engaged. We'll take a look at Ringu and Juon first. These films, they contain the element of horror that death seems accidental and inescapable. This comes in the form of a curse, which is quite common in Asian horror movies. Ringu gives us a curse tape, and Juon contains a curse which follows anyone who enters the house. Each of these curses follow you wherever you go, which takes away that feeling of safety, right? Like, your personal space and home are places where you're supposed to feel safe. But these films take that away from the audience, and as soon as someone makes contact with a curse, death is sure to be close by. The fact that these instances happen randomly and through complete accident, it adds to that feeling of, it can happen to me at any time. Like, these people are just everyday, average people. Neither good nor evil, just plain unlucky. And these films really showcase the idea of the characters' lives not mattering to the story and still being completely helpless. There's no lesson to be learned, and no one's really in control, which adds to the overall fear you feel while experiencing these films. Then when it ends, you're left with more unanswered questions and feelings of hopelessness, which is where the true terror really comes into play with these types of films. Once we end up getting into our own heads and start exploring that fear of the unknown, that's when the real magic happens. We're going to be discussing two Asian horror movies on today's episode of the podcast, and it's not Ringu or Juan. These are actually two of my favorite Asian horror movies ever, and one of them is my contender for the best horror movie of 2022. Two of them are Incantation and Gonjium Haunted Asylum. Both are terrifying movies, yet in completely different ways. <laughs> one of them is focused on a mother's struggle with a curse, and the other is a haunted asylum where investigators try to find a supernatural presence. The film Incantation was inspired by an incident which occurred in the Gushan district in 2005. There was a family of six who made claims that they were possessed by a variety of Chinese religious deities. They then also accused each other of being possessed by demons who were masquerading as deities. They ended up burning each other with incense and hitting each other with sticks and spirit tables to try and expel the demons. The eldest daughter of the family was killed by the remaining members of the family. The survivors were then charged with the offense of abandoning a helpless person resulting in the person's death. The case was looked at by many as one of mass hysteria, and this just makes the movie all the more frightening in my opinion. The director of Incantation, Kevin Ko, he explained that much of what is seen in the film, such as the hand gestures, the chants, the symbols, they're all fictitious, which is a very important thing to remember while you're watching this movie. They did just a really good job at leaving you absolutely terrified by the end of it. (laughs) The film's budget was primarily spent on these fictitious designs and prop production, such as the large statue of Mother Buddha that's seen throughout the film. Incantation was first showcased at the Network of Asian Fantastic Films project during an international film festival in 2019. This was even before the film was entered into production, believe it or not. It was then released in Taiwan on March 18th, 2022, and also screened at the Far East Film Festival. It wasn't until June of 2022 that Netflix announced it would be distributing the film globally 
on July 8th, 2022. And the film went on to gross $5.7 million, which not only makes it the highest grossing film in Taiwan for 2022, but for all time. And to be honest with you, I'm not surprised because they really did an excellent job of leading you on throughout the entire movie and keeping you scared yet suspended the whole time. So let's dive into Incantation and talk about what happens in the movie and why this is going to be definitely my supernatural horror movie of 2022. Incantation starts us off with a woman named Lee Ronan, and she is also our narrator for the film. She's pleading with the audience and completely breaking the fourth wall, which immediately sucks you into the film. She starts to plead, and her pleads are to memorize an insignia, and then chant an incantation, which is meant to send blessings and lift the curse of her six-year-old daughter, Dodo. This same insignia and incantation are placed throughout the film as well several different times to encourage the audience to pray along and help save her daughter. And this was something that I felt really brought the audience into the film. Like it made you feel like you were a part of it and experiencing the same terror alongside the characters. It really helped with keeping me engaged in the film and building that suspense of what is actually going to happen and what is actually happening to begin with. It doesn't help that the film is shown in a found footage style, and it's non-linear, which makes that feeling of separation and loneliness even more apparent. And we go back to six years earlier with Ronan, who is alongside her boyfriend Dom and his cousin Juan. They end up going to visit a temple when they break a religious taboo while documenting a ritual for their YouTube channel. The village they went to was a remote village of the Chen clan, who are relatives to Dom and Wan. They practiced an esoteric Yunnan religion which worshipped an ancestral deity named Mother Buddha. The clan had asked these three to submit their names along with the incantation to Mother Buddha. In a strange turn of events, <laughs> a clan elder ends up approaching Ronan and tells her that she must also submit her daughter's name once she's born. Ronan at the time was surprised because, well, she was unaware that she was actually pregnant. That same night, the group ends up spying on the clan, and they're performing a ritual with a young girl who's being prepared for a sacrifice. The girl's completely unconscious, and she has runes covering her entire body. The clan ends up leaving her body in front of a tunnel, which the clan has said was forbidden to enter, yet this group didn't heed their warning. (laughs) Ronan waited with the young girl, while Dom and Juan go in and destroy the barricades so they can enter this tunnel. That was their second mistake. (laughs) Juan soon emerges from the tunnel, screaming hysterically, and Dom's lifeless body is later seen being carried from the tunnel by villagers. Then, Dodo is born, the daughter of Ronan. Once Ronan gave birth, she left Dodo at a foster care home, while she sought out psychiatric help. This is what we're seeing with flashbacks, because what they're doing is they're going back, kind of giving you a prequel in terms of flashbacks, and then they come back to present day. So now we're in present day. And in present day, after Ronan's gotten her psychiatric help, Dodo's been in foster care, we find that Ronan's now recovered, and she's taking Dodo from the foster care now at this point. Shortly after that, their home ends up becoming a hub for unexplained phenomena, and Dodo is also disturbed by some sort of shadowy presence which follows her around. Over time, Dodo develops a debilitating illness while her mother's mental health also begins to drop. Social workers end up arriving, they take Dodo away, but Ronan gets help in basically escaping and kidnapping Dodo and they go on the run together. At this point, the story really shows us a mother who is falling completely apart, and what she's doing is everything that she can to save her daughter. Even despite the fact that she doesn't truly understand what's going on at this point, she is doing everything she can to keep her daughter safe and try to save her. So she ends up bringing Dodo to a shrine, where there is a priest and his wife. They both agree to attempt an exorcism on Dodo, with the condition that she is not to eat for the next seven days. However, over the seven days, Dodo's condition deteriorates and runes begin to appear all over her body. Ronan can't hold it back any longer, and she ends up feeding Dodo, which is when the priest and his wife end up becoming violently killed. It's then revealed through the footage from the tunnel that was shot earlier on by Dom and Juan that it isn't entirely destroyed. This footage ends up being sent to Ronin, which shows Dom and Juan reaching the altar of Mother Buddha inside of the tunnel. However, the face of the statue is covered by a veil. Dom tries to remove the veil and ends up becoming possessed and starts smashing his head brutally to death. Juan is also shown to have become possessed and is then violently killed by unseen forces. This is one of the things that makes Asian horror so terrifying. (laughs) Like, that unknown element and not being able to know or see absolutely everything that's happening the genre just has an amazing talent at tapping into that fear that fear of the unknown and just really making it stick with you 
then we get to the part of the movie that really made me go, what the fuck? <laughs> like, this to me was like the twist to end all twists. I actually really dig it. The twist in this movie, it was so well executed to the point that I was suspicious that this was like the direction they were going in. So much so that I had hoped it was true. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's how good of a twist it is. And if you haven't seen this movie, I highly suggest stopping here. Otherwise, it's going to ruin the entire movie for you. <laughs> like, this will ruin it for you. I'll give you a minute. But come back. Please come back. All right. So Ronan is seen talking to us. The viewer. She's breaking the fourth wall again. We find out that she's been lying to us all along. A priest in Yunnan had explained to Ronan that the Mother Buddha is actually a malevolent entity. And if you submit your name along with the incantation, you agree to carry the curse, which is the exact thing that she's been making the viewer do the entire movie. See what I mean by terrifying? <laughs> it made us feel like we may actually be cursed now too. And the thing is, when more people chant the curse, it spreads out and the burden on those cursed become lighter. The reason why the Mother Buddha statue had a veil over it is because the face is the source of the curse and it needs to be covered pretty sweet twist right <laughs> like pretty awesome twist and puts you in the seat of oh shit i am fucked <laughs> because you may have been doing the incantation throughout the whole movie and now you're sitting there going fuck am i cursed now so then we see ronan returning to the altar inside the tunnel and she asks us the audience for our name before revealing the face of mother buddha on camera she then becomes possessed and smashes her own head into the altar the ending of the film shows dodo healthy and happy which leaves us with the implication that the burden of the curse has been shared with all of us watching which is pretty sweet right showing dodo's healthy and happy now it's because well we're all sharing that burden of the curse great message at the same time right and the fact that this movie was produced with the found footage technique, it really adds to the unsettling nature of incantation. <laughs> Seriously, it's, it's a technique that gives us horrific experiences in a very realistic format. And that makes it difficult for us to separate fiction from reality. At its core, though, incantation really shows the lengths that a mother is willing to go to have custody of their child. There's, there's really an overwhelming sense of the need for stability in the midst of all this personal turmoil happening, which is an aspect some of the audience may be able to relate to, right? It's a, it's a truly humanizing element, which proves to still be relatable even in the wildest of circumstances. And the actress who played Ronan really sold it due to her strong performance. Even during moments where things seem a little tame, she's able to sell the character through intimate moments with herself or her daughter. And the reason that the end twist is truly so impactful is because of how well the story was executed and how the characters were developed. I can also tell that Kevin Co. was very deliberate in the pacing of Incantation. He uses every minute to develop a fully realized curse, which gives us time to connect with the case while making those fear-inducing scenes more impactful. Overall, I would consider Incantation right alongside Terrifier 2 for me when it comes to top contender for horror movie of the year. Then you have a movie that was released prior to this year, which is talked about by some, but I think needs to be known by many more. Gonjium Haunted Asylum. It's another found footage movie, but this is a found footage paranormal movie which is sure to leave you with residual nightmares, just like Incantation. <laughs> The setting of the film, it takes place in the former Gongjiam Psychiatric Hospital in Guangzhou. This is reported to be one of Korea's most haunted locations. On top of that, it was also selected as one of the seven most freakiest places on the planet in 2012 by CNN Travel. All of this makes the film that much more terrifying to watch. <laughs> like I was saying earlier, any time you can take elements of reality and blend it with film generally makes for some memorable moments. And Gongium is definitely not one that strays away from disturbing images and cheeky camera work. The majority of the film was shot in the National Maritime High School in Busan, with the production team closely adhering to the floor plan of the actual psychiatric hospital. It was their goal to exactly recreate the same exterior and hallways to capture the same atmosphere of the original hospital in the film. Prior to the film's release, the owner of the actual asylum filed a lawsuit against the film producers to prevent it from being shown in theaters. The claim was that the film would have a negative impact on the sale of the building, which was currently underway. Despite the lawsuit, though, courts were in favor of the film producers and ruled in late March of 2018 that the film could be shown in theaters. The film was then released to audiences in South Korea on March 28, 2018, and the Gongjiam Psychiatric Hospital was then demolished on May 28, 2018. 
The film released to a great box office, coming in first domestically and made $1.2 million. Gangium held the top spot for four days and reached $10.2 million in its opening weekend and was the biggest March opening ever for a Korean film. After three weeks, the film had reached almost 2.6 million people and had made $20.3 million, which became the second highest grossing Korean horror film, right behind the 2003 film A Tale of Two Sisters. And I first heard of this movie from one of the fans of the podcast during an Instagram live session. And my girlfriend, she's all about that paranormal and supernatural elements of horror, so she was immediately wanting to watch this. I checked out the trailer on YouTube, and it looked even more terrifying than I expected it to be. Like, the content you can find on this movie on YouTube, it's ridiculous, and it captures a lot of the terror that you're going to experience while watching the film. So let's not delay, and let's head into what happens during Gongjim Haunted Asylum. The film starts off by introducing us to two boys, who are documenting their exploration of the abandoned Gongjim Psychiatric Hospital. The rumor surrounding this hospital is that the director had killed all of the patients and then went missing. The most intriguing room of the hospital is room 402, which is the intensive care unit. No one has ever been able to open the door to room 402 before. However, the two boys decide they're going to be the ones who do it. So they try to open the door when they suddenly hear a ping pong ball, something that was synonymous with the psycho director who killed all the patients. Their broadcast ends up abruptly ending, and we catch a glimpse of a ghostly figure, which prompts many members of the YouTube community to embark on their own journey to determine what happened and explore the hospital. This catches the attention of Ha Jun, who hosts a channel called Horror Times on YouTube. He gets together a group of six people for a live broadcast into the hospital, and they get set up ready to go. Ha Jun stays at their base, which is in a camp off the road, and he's controlling the broadcast from here while everyone else heads inside to do the dirty work. When the group gets inside, Charlotte pours holy water in a dish and records the reactions of the environment. Nothing really comes of it, so they head into the director's office and find a group photo which contains all the patients and staff. They also find a doll in the lab, which is discovered later on to be moving on its own, and it's also being held by one of the patients in the group photo that they found. Super creepy, right? Anytime you got dolls or tokens, or it's just going to be a creep fest at that point. In my opinion, that's what creeps me out. Anyways, some of the group tries to open the door to room 402, the infamous door that nobody can open. Others of the group, they decide that they're going to explore the group treatment room. It's in here that there are tons of strange looking coffins with holes in them. One of them decides that they're going to put their hand into one of these holes, and they quickly realize that that was a terrible idea. <laughs> She gets pulled into the hole, and when she retrieves her arm, there are obvious wounds on it like she'd just been attacked. After this, two of them decide that they're not fucking around and finding out. They're going to head out and leave. So, back at the camp, we have Hajun, who is reviewing the footage that's been taken so far. And in the footage, he notices that everyone is standing together and comes to a very disturbing realization. He's currently watching footage of everyone standing together. So who's filming them? <laughs> right? At the same time, the two who decided that they were going to leave the hospital, they end up walking around in circles outside trying to find their way back to camp. One of them ends up going into a trance-like state and their eyes completely black out. Then the other one runs away, obviously, tries to get to the base camp, only to find themselves back at the asylum and specifically in room 402. The remaining group in the hospital, they witness a wheelchair moving in the basement, everything in the room begins to float, shit is going down, right? Like two of these kids, they get knocked out by flying objects, they wake up, they get dragged away by an invisible force. And it's then uncovered at this point that the whole journey they were on was actually meant to be scripted, <laughs> and the events that are unfolding are real, and they need to rescue everyone and get the fuck out. And this movie did a really good job of that fear of the unknown. Like, I love paranormal movies that don't show you a ghost. They don't show you a face or a presence or something. It's just like an energy. It's that fear of the unknown because you get to use your own imagination to determine what that monster looks like to you. And that is scary. <laughs> So as the group is trying to rescue everyone and get the fuck out of the hospital, a ping pong ball starts bouncing towards them and they hear screams coming from inside room 402. The door then opens and the screen goes completely dark. The group ends up finding themselves in a dark room without any exit while also standing knee deep in water. Now, for those of you who have ever played the video game Fatal Frame, <laughs> the opening scene of that game comes to mind. The first time I saw this scene, because numerous ghosts start to appear, and they each get possessed one after another and swallowed in by the darkness. Really super cool scene. Now, back at the camp, we still have Hajun. 
and he's watching his viewership reach almost a million views. Now, during this time, he notices that the crew's no longer filming because they're all fucking dead, but he doesn't, un he doesn't comprehend that. So he decides he's going to go investigate, see what's going on with the crew, and ends up getting strangled to death. After that, we find out that the YouTube live stream had actually got cut off when they admitted that the whole thing was supposed to be scripted. So none of that other cool stuff was actually caught. Everyone thinks it's a sham, and the viewership starts to dwindle as the movie fades out and ends. This film was really a great piece of commentary on YouTube culture and the whole idea surrounding paranormal investigators. If you can't handle the answer... Don't ask the question. <laughs> like, this is very important. If you ever decide you want to start messing with spirits or energies, this group definitely got more than they bargained for. When you try to go up against ghosts and you don't know what you're doing, trust me, you're in for a bad time. This film itself, it has so much disturbing imagery that it's perfect for anyone who's a fan of the paranormal or even just found footage films in general. They did a really good job at building suspense and shooting scenes in a certain way that just keeps you enthralled, keeps you on the edge of your seat, and has you just freaking out every moment of the film. 